we're basically we're both uh, pulling out our hair. Find what is the best way forward as a field getting these things faster to people in their yeah. current lifespans. There are people listening to all these other podcasts, not here because it's all geroscientists here, right? But they're like, okay, so when are you going to tell me what to take now? It's like, we need to test these things and I know what needs to happen. What I need to know is how to get there or or the things to make well, happen to make them happen. Yeah. So look, I think there is progress here. And again, I, I, I go back and forth between being probably like you, you know, extremely frustrated sometimes with the slow pace to being extremely optimistic with, with the direction things are going. And I feel uh, uh, optimistic about the fact that, that there are some initiatives happening right now, particularly in the political realm, that could have an impact. So, you know, from things like the Alliance for Longevity Initiatives, the Longevity Caucus and the United States House of Representatives. I mean, there is some movement um, in the right direction. And, you know, I'm involved in that. So I know some things that I probably can't talk about here, other than to say that there are, you know, at some reasonably high levels, the right people getting in the room to have these discussions that could potentially have an impact. So I think things are going in the right direction. At the same time, there's clearly also a dramatic increase in the awareness of longevity, uh, among a broader constituency and, and even to some extent now among the general public. Lots of reasons for that. Um, you know, pros and cons associated with that. I think the term longevity has expanded quite dramatically beyond just the science of aging. And I'm, you know, that that that's probably a good thing at some level. But I think there is a growing awareness. And so I think we will we will see, you know, forces that are pushing to accelerate the rate at which some of these discoveries are in fact, you know, moved forward and eventually validated. Again, it's not going to be a straight path. It's not all, it's not going to be easy. Um, it's not going to be painless, but I think we will see over the next 10 years, you know, some pretty strong pressures in place that will kind of accelerate the rate at which we can start to, to validate some of these things um, and hopefully, you know, improve quality and quantity of life for a lot of people in, in the process. Um, I, I I agree with everything you've said, and I think we need to we need to find um, a sort of focus. This reminds me of a line from there's a book that I read. Um, it had an extremely uh, specific title of something like German Jewish scientists from this year to that year, because it was written by uh, the uh, student or the, uh, of um, a Nobel laureate in uh, medicine and physiology, and I was reading it because I was. I was curious to learn a little bit about him because he, it turns out he was my, my grandfather's uh, cousin in 1922, <laughs> isolated some of glycolysis and, you know, glycolysis of fermentation, that, that, that kind of thing. Anyway, we, the, the Ebden-Meyerhof pathway, a few isolates there and the high energy, subsequent high energy bonds and phosphate groups, uh, not yet ATP, but that they had energy sub after the Nobel. Anyway, the line it reminds me of is before he, he came to uh, really be prolific is he had so many interests and he just couldn't focus. He was like scattered all over the place. And it seems to me as a field, uh, we need to focus. Um, so hmm. perhaps, I mean, I don't think we need to focus around. I think we need to compete against each other in the right ways to for brilliant ideas and say, no, you're wrong. And I want to do it this way. And I look at that different. That's our strength. And to for that to be rewarded, that kind of positive competitive spirit. But we also need to sort of coordinate a way where we can be more effective politically. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, I think, you know, one of the one of the things that I think you were just alluding to is, you know, uh, should the field? It's a it's a good question. Should the field actually coalesce around uh, a messaging campaign, for lack of a better way of saying it, right? Um, uh, going forward, because I think there is a there. I certainly have suggested, and I know other people have as well, that sometimes the way that we message the importance of this space um, can can be at competing interests, right? In the sense that, you know, if we're trying to engage politicians and funders, serious people who do serious science uh, to take longevity seriously, 
um, some of the messaging I think runs counter to that, you know, and I, 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 I know people don't like to hear this, but it's just a fact, right? When you talk about immortality and longevity escape velocity, um, a lot of serious people immediately get turned off. And so I think it's worth asking the question, should we be more intentional in the way that we message ourselves uh, to different constituencies? And I don't think there has been a lot of thought around this in the field. And, and, and I think for a long time, scientists in the field um, we're hesitant to engage in this conversation because we wanted to be in our lab doing our science. And one of the consequences of that is that the people who were out there, you know, with the, the, the megaphone weren't necessarily the scientists. And so we've gotten to this point in the field now where we have, depending on who you talk to, a lot of very different perspectives on, you know, what's being communicated to the general public. And, you know, I've, I've been, you know, pretty honest in my assessment that I think there are some, some reasons that, that there, I think there are some reasons to believe that there have been costs to making unrealistic um, expectations or presenting unrealistic expectations to people that aren't data driven. Like the Obama moonshot, maybe. Well, I look, I, I can't say, I like, I wasn't that. in the room. I'm not going to say that that, that I'm not going to say that the, uh, the, the uh, more flamboyant uh, aspects of the community were the de deciding factor for why, why geroscience wasn't selected for an Obama moonshot. It was on the list. And it was being discussed at the highest levels. I think, though, what I can say with absolute certainty is that the serious people who make those kinds of decisions, and I've talked to, to many of them, um, are turned off by that kind of nonsense. And it has an impact on the way that they view the quality of science in the field. I don't think anybody who was around in this field 15 years ago would argue with the statement that uh, aging was viewed as a backwater scientific discipline by the rest of the scientific community to some extent because of the lack of quality control in the way that the field was messaged. Like that is just a fact. <laughs> so it is absolutely the case that the way we talk about, we being the larger community, not individuals, the way we talk about our science in the public domain has an impact on the way that we are viewed by the rest of the scientific community. And if we if we use sort of non-scientific language, that can have a detrimental effect. I think there's no question that how we articulate ourselves has an impact. Our diversity is a strength in many ways, but ultimately, we, it's a, it's valuable for us to come together around a similar vision. That is, the counter argument is something to the effect of, unless we are specific or specific enough, we won't be taken seriously and they believe we have no idea or we don't really believe in the cause. So is there, the question is, is there a middle ground between promising the sun and the moon and the stars yesterday on one end and on the other end, uh, saying, you know, this is what we know now and what we find we don't know. A, a lot of people in positions of power look for forward-looking projections or estimates or probabilities yeah. may, may, may or may not be in the cards, it's not even for something probabilistic, but is there some middle ground into something you can have as a deliverable for saying that's specific enough that you can say, we, we can target this in this way well, I think we've had that. I mean, I think, first of all, I would say we've, you know, I actually don't think that um, when we actually sit down and talk precisely about what we believe, that there is as much of a gap as is perceived. Like, I have never said that I am against longevity escape velocity or that I don't believe that's possible or that I don't believe someday we'll get there. I've never said that. I'm all for it. <laughs> um but I think we need to be honest about what we know now. And I and I also would say that, you know, many of us have said for a long time that a couple of decades of health span is well within reach, right? Given what we know today, certainly with what we're going to know in the next, you know, decade. 
Um, to me, that's actually a pretty big deal. And people have done the economics. People, you know, you can look at what the impact would be. So, so I think I think we can and have given some projections, realistic, maybe optimistic, but but realistic given what we know now about what is possible. Um, and I certainly don't have any problem with saying that you know we can't put an upper limit on what is possible. Will we be able to exceed 120 years in people? uh life life healthy life expectancy maybe is there any evidence that we can do that now no um i think we just need to be honest about what we know i you know i i i i'm actually have taken a step back from from twitter because i find it kind of annoying half the time but i did tweet recently you know i know that, uh, the other half of the time you follow me right that's right <laughs> um that you know belief in the absence of evidence is faith yeah. right so it's fine if we want to say, okay, I have faith that we're going to achieve longevity escape velocity. That's fine. I don't have any problem with that. But there's no evidence to support that. Zero. There, there, there just isn't, as far as I'm aware, any evidence to support that. And so we have we just have to be honest with people. Or, you know, this language around reversing aging, I think, is another good example. Okay. Can we take phenotypes of aging and reverse them? Sure that's been done over and over and over again, right? Can we take an old mouse and make it young again? No, nobody's ever done that. But it gets presented as if that's happened already, right? You can you can find articles written, there was a, one on CNN probably a year ago that implied that an old mouse had been made young again. That's just bullshit. It's just not true. <laughs> and when we present it to the public as if it is true, I think that's a problem. Yeah, I, 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 there was a, you know, there was a, you mentioned your frustration with Twitter. I, I, I had, I had my frustration behind a smiling emoji. I sometimes, and earlier I said I was extremely frustrated by the slow rate for translation. And you mentioned you're sometimes you're that, sometimes you're the opposite. And the truth is, sometimes I'm that, and sometimes I'm the opposite, <laughs> and sometimes within a matter of minutes, over yeah. several flips over the course of a short segment of time. But what is clear to me is. Yeah, I was saying there was a time that I believed, well, maybe we need some sort of consensus conference. And now I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm way beyond that level of na naive, like where people are going to continue to embrace what they believe is the messaging that they believe will create the kind of support that they believe is good for humanity and there's a society. lot of belief in there i, no, I hear you no, the, the, but it, it does take belief on belief they need it's not just i think there's a, a beliefs about the future are probabilistic right yeah and then there's a belief in terms of ways of describing it you can describe different things different ways and we can decide to be more or less conservative verbiage so part of this isn't just beliefs part of this is stylistic part of this is how much people are Science, conservative scientists versus let's let's be most give the most optimistic vision of what might be attainable. So I'm not, I'm not saying that they're all right, but what I'm saying is a consensus yeah. conference that's not going to get us there because people are going to follow what they believe, regardless. So I, I I I I I agree with you. Um, and again, I would say you know if you took the most what you're calling optimistic people in the field. I actually think if you if you if we sat down and talked about what we actually believe is the case now, where we might get to, there's not going to be that much separation. It's not as far apart as people think in terms of what we actually Kennedy, believe. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. here's what I would say. My concern stems much more from I don't care what you believe. You can believe whatever you want. My concern stems much more from presenting it in a misleading way um, and sometimes dishonest, right? And I think there can be a difference. Something can pre be presented in an honest way that at least matches the data that is misleading. And then there's the, the, the sort of line you step over, which is sometimes hard to define where it's just outright dishonest. But what I would say is, I think you're talking about intentionality, right? So, so the, this question of, was it intentionally misleading, right? I'm, I'm actually, and I, obviously that's important, but I, I, I would say to some extent, if it's misleading, it's misleading, regardless of whether the person who misled 
intended it to be misleading, right? So this is where I actually tend to focus a lot of, not that I want to spend all my time playing policeman because I don't and I can't and, you know, that doesn't, not going to accomplish anything. But, but when I do comment on these things, it's usually because I perceive that it is misleading people. And that I think is problematic. And that gets back to the reputation of the field as a whole. If you, if you routinely mislead people, um, even if the misleading is just at the level of over-promising and under-delivering, if you do that a lot, people are going to stop trusting you. And we have trust problems with this field based on some of what has happened in the past. And my concern is that if we continue to mislead people, that that, that is going to, to have a negative impact on the credibility of the field going forward. The other, the last thing I'll say, and I don't want to spend much more time on this. I think it, people, it's pretty clear <laughs> what my opinion is, but I do want to say that, you know, um, when I got up at the, at the Dublin conference recently and kind of gave my perspective and said, I think it's important that we set realistic expectations and we hit those expectations so that people can, can trust us going forward. Um, one of the responses that, that, that was put forward is that, you know, that that's a lack of courage that, you know, wouldn't it be nice if gero scientists could be more courageous about our expectations for what's going to happen in the future. And I think that I would, I would frame it as integrity. I think that talking honestly about what you believe to be the case and what you expect to happen in the future is integrity and being careful not to mislead people is integrity. It has nothing to do with courage. I'm not, I have no fear of where the field is going to go. I think we need to be honest about what we see and what we expect um, and just be clear with people about the current state of the field. And I think if you look at the data, and maybe this will lead into the next topic, if you look at the data, there is no evidence that I can see. Now, there's a lot of good stuff happening in the field. There's a lot of, a lot of I think, momentum towards translation of what we've learned in the last 15 or 20 years to have an impact on people's lives. But there is no evidence that we are getting better at increasing longevity in any organism, period, full stop. If anything, it's gone the opposite direction. That if if you're promising people that we are approaching longevity escape velocity, and the data actually suggests that if anything, we haven't gotten better than caloric restriction in the last 50 years, those two things seem to be, you know, different, right? They don't support each other. And, and so I think again, we, we should look at the data, um, understand what what the data actually are and then and then think about what that means and that's that's you know leading into this idea of has the field actually stagnated in a lot of ways no in a lot of ways the field has made progress we've we've done a deep dive on the hallmarks of aging we're starting now to see efforts to translate this into into humans that's all great um but when you look at the absolute magnitude of our ability to modify longevity it really hasn't gone upward, and as far as I can tell, in the last fifty years, twenty years. Now we were talking about integrity. I can't let that pass without me saying that uh, there's no question in my mind that as a, that you are not uh, someone who has any fear about the future. Rather, you embrace the truth, even if it's difficult or ugly, <laughs> and you will say it. You will call it out. You might not always be right, but like the surgeon. You're, you're going to call bull, you know, bullshit in your mind if it looks like bullshit to you. It might not be bullshit. Sometimes it might be bullshit, but you're going to call it, I'm setting a record for how many times I'm going to bleed. I don't know if I'll bleed <laughs> myself out. But anyway, what I'm saying is you speak your mind and that's what integrity is. Someone who has integrity is someone who feels a certain way and says it and then acts it. And you're all three. And when someone has all those three things aligned in their life, People believe them because they've earned that respect and they've earned that trust. And that's something that makes you a thought leader, which in turn is uh, what brought you here, not just because you've uh, pioneered and been successful. And I think you've pioneered and been successful exactly because you are able to face difficult data and change directions and adapt as you need to. Like every, every good scientist, you need to be reality-based in order to be good scientist. Uh, but you're a good science communicator as well because you 
speak your mind clearly, articulately. And um, I, I want to be, for one, though seeing myself the diplomat that I am, and I, I, I be um, selective where I have, you know what I mean? Like there are official guidelines that come out of organizations and they pick particular topics every once in a while, or a Supreme Court takes on a case from time to time when they feel like I do the same thing when I feel net good in the community. But I just want to say, don't don't you change, Matt. That's that's. <laughs> I don't think you have to worry about that. that. You know. So, so th th first of all, thank you for for the those very kind comments. I, I do a, oh, oh, appreciate wait, wait, it. And I, I, I had the other point to make. The other point you said about I, I had and something. Now I you're going to get something gonna I appreciate me, huh? about your high integrity is when people disagree with you, <laughs> like about your the dosing you and and Peter Tia came out. Uh, you know, ha have I, I have come to a different conclusion. Under various scenario analyses, that it's that it's higher, at least insofar as the data we have now. Here's sure. some, something else. I don't think the fact that we have not made progress with regard to lifespan extension since caloric restriction and rapamycin, maximum life expense is is a uh, not just not a cause for pessimism. And you haven't said you're pessimistic. I, I'm not saying you said that, but I also don't think it's a cause not to believe we have reason to be more apt to optimistic about the rate of change going in the future. I believe people can make forward projections like we do in physics about acceleration. When I see the acceleration, the underlying technology, whether it's a AI or CRISPR, single cell sequencing, you name it, it's just exploded our understanding of the hallmarks of aging and so forth. So just as the, I think some people talk about, you know, the the, the Wright brothers. On one hand, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, and I'm borrowing this from, from analogy from Aubrey de, de, de Grey with uh, uh, HT, that, you know, Aubrey, Leonardo da Vinci said, we'll have flying machines, right? And he could have projected he'll have flying machines the next decade and we didn't have it sure. forever after that okay so he was wrong 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 but the truth is eventually pro technology got enough that and you know until you've got that first plane off the ground you don't really know so what instills in me a sense of confidence that we can say not just we're making progress but that progress is accelerating and i think also you would agree with because you made the statement you believe the in the next 10 to 20 years or something to that effect we'll be seeing some of these that we do have some basis for having I'm, I'm not saying for longevity escape velocity that's not what i'm inserting in the outcome variable effect, yeah. but meaningful things hitting patients yeah no i think you're right but i would also say those two things are potentially very different right so so the impact of current state of knowledge in the field in patients, right, I think is probably going to be a direct result of focusing on the hallmarks of aging, doing those deep dives, understanding the biology better, new new technologies for delivering these things in people. Um, and that's all important. Like I'm, I'm all for that. And again, this gets back to what we talked about before. I don't think we should stop doing that. <laughs> I, I think that's important. But I also think, you know, at, and you might be right. Who knows? This is this is this is, I think, one of the the challenges. Um, you might be right. A breakthrough could happen tomorrow, which would revolutionize the entire field. Uh, and and what I would say, so the people who push back when I say this is is exactly what you said. Well, you know, look at AI. AI is going to revolutionize the our understanding of aging and our ability to you know uh, reach longevity, escape velocity, or whatever. It might. I don't know. All I'm saying is there's no data to support that. <laughs> there is no evidence beyond, well, look at the Wright brothers, right? No, no, I'm so, saying there is. That's where I dis that's where I, I disagree. But I think what's the data? But I think wait, wait, wait. I think the final conclusion uh we have is the same. Just as Peter Atia has a very sophisticated way of looking at evidence regarding clinical decision making, where it's not just evidence-based guidelines, but you incorporate all the forms of data that exist out there. For example, a lot of our nutritional guidelines, as imperfect and wrong as they are and as flawed as we'll find they'll be eventually, we can sort of compile with 
data from multiple data sources, uh, though they're not long-term randomized controlled trials. But based on this other data that we have, it seems like a reasonable bet that doing so has a reasonable chance. So I'm not saying something will happen or has to happen. I'm some, and I'm certainly not injecting longevity escape velocity into our discussion. What I'm saying is I think we we both can come to the conclusion that your statement is absolutely correct, and I'll agree 100% that we don't have anything to prove or to show in terms of actually extending human lifespan. Uh, looking at the metric that I'm, I think is a more realistic one over the shorter term of extending yeah. human health span, I think sure. we have we do have data. And I agree. We have, it's just that the data we have is not the form of data of, of obviously extending it through aging hallmarks, although I would argue, Matt, that um, that might be the way things that some of the things that do work, they work through that. We just don't see all those connections yet. But uh, I'm saying that the, that we do have data and, and, and the data is where the point where we have reason to believe that there, there's a higher probability than ever that that fundamental knowledge and applications we're seeing pan out in model organisms, there's no reason to believe they wouldn't, they, they don't have the potential to pan out, at least in some capacity, to some extent in, in, in primates. Yeah. Too. So I, I agree completely with that. I, I, I just want to be clear. I, I am not suggesting that there is a, a any lower likelihood that the the geroscience discoveries that have been made in the last ten years are not going to have an impact on human health. I believe they will. Um, uh, that's the whole point of you know half of what I'm doing these days. Um, what what I'm saying is that I don't think there's any reason to believe that we have gotten fundamentally better at modulating the biology of aging to have larger effects on health span and lifespan in the last 10 years, 20 years. I don't think that we have seen, and I'm not saying that it couldn't be the case, maybe reprogramming will be that, but there's no data to support that yet. And so the question is, why haven't we continued to do better, right? Why haven't we continued to find things that have a bigger impact in the, in the field? I, th I, th I think it's not just a good question. I think it is the questions or one of a set of the questions that the field uh, needs to answer, which is really a great segue.